Sublation Media viewers, listeners, and readers. It's me again, Douglas Lane, and this video will examine the question of the coming singularity, or what's called simulation theory, all while recontextualizing your understanding of the power and limits of the media environment that you occupy and that occupies you. The subject of this speech is a topic which has been discovered recently and which may not exist at all. to remember past lives, I claim to remember a different, very different present life. I know of no one who has ever made this claim before, but I rather suspect that my experience is not unique. What perhaps is unique is the fact that I am willing to talk about it. We are living in a computer programmed reality, and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed. and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present, deja vu. The subject of this speech is a topic which has been discovered recently and which may not exist at all. Perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words, I submit that these impressions are valid and significant. And I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off. The subject of this speech is a topic which has been discovered recently and which may not exist at all. In the 20th century, social critics such as Gita Bord and Theodore Adorno looked upon the innovations in communication technology that emerged after the Second World War with both fear and skepticism. Adorno, combining psychoanalytic theory with traditional Marxism, argued that what he called the culture industry was reshaping the inner life of the working class and producing a passive mass society with strong authoritarian tendencies. The French radical Guy Debord took his critique further, suggesting that the power of the image in the electronic age had replaced the power of labor. While in the 19th and early 20th centuries, social relations were directed by the production of commodities and the competition in the market. In the new society, our lives were controlled by what he called the spectacle. The spectacle was not merely a collection of images broadcast on television, projected onto movie screens, and populating the interiors of magazines and the surfaces of billboards, but rather it was a way of life, a zeitgeist. As he put it, the spectacle is not a collection of images, it is a social relation between people that is mediated by images. Today, our communication technologies have developed to the point that this idea that we are living in a world directed by images no longer appears to be adequate. Rather than being merely directed by images, we are beginning to suspect that we ourselves are nothing but images. Or, to be more accurate, some of us suspect that we are destined to become, or already are, Nothing more than a series of zeros and ones stored within a computer. The billionaire CEO of the social media website Twitter once wrote, The strongest argument for us being in a simulation is the following. Forty years ago, we had Pong, like two rectangles and a dot. That was what games were. Now, 40 years later, we have photorealistic 3D simulations with millions of people playing simultaneously and it's getting better every year. And soon, we will have virtual reality or augmented reality. 
In order for this argument from Musk to make sense, we'll need to take up the full argument as it was originally proposed by the Swedish philosopher Nick Bostrom. Bostrom argued that if we imagine that computer-run simulations of reality may one day reach the point wherein they are indistinguishable from reality, and we speculate that computer-generated personalities within this simulation are conscious beings, then it is likely that in the course of all time, the majority of conscious entities will be simulations. Given that for these simulations, the difference between reality and simulation will be impossible to discern, we must then ask ourselves, what is the likelihood that we ourselves are simulations? In the context of this argument, Elon Musk's tweet, his claim that we are living in a computer simulation, makes some sense. Further, his determination to create virtual reality and experiment with uploading people's minds into computers can be understood as well. He is attempting to prove that he himself, along with everyone else, is very likely to be a computer simulation already. However, we should examine what the consequences of this proposition that we are all computer simulations might turn out to be. Specifically, we should try to think this proposition all the way to the end. What would this idea that our consciousness is determined by and consists of computer programming turn out to mean epistemologically and ontologically? What would it be possible to know from within a computer simulation? And what sorts of beings would we have to be? To begin with, simulation theory is not ontological at all. That is, it does not propose that the simulation is real, but rather that the empirical world we perceive is merely an appearance and that the true reality is altogether different from what we believe about this world. We think we see a table, but according to Musk and Bostrom, what we are experiencing is a computer language, a program, a secret code. Now, let's consider a joke or a put-on. Let's think about Sasha Baron Cohen and how he irritated the late cultural commentator Andy Rooney in August of 2004. Let's talk about some mistakes that has happened or not happened. Has journalists ever put out tomorrow's news by mistake? How do you know what the news is if it hasn't happened yet? Yo, but if there was something like well important, like a plane crash, wouldn't you report that like a day early? How would you report a plane crash that happens tomorrow, today? All right, safe. Well, you couldn't do that, but let's say it was something like the election, which is like a massive thing. Wouldn't you report who won that like a few days before because it's going to be such a massive story that everyone will want to know about it and reads about it for ages? But you don't know who won it, do you, until it's, the election is over. How can you report it before it happens? Yo, for real. Okay, so, I think that's about it. I, well, think, I, I don't think we need any more. While Ali G's question is absurd, there is a way to imagine reasonable justifications for it, especially if we turn to another interview with Andy Rooney, this one from 1982 on Late Night with David Letterman, for context. Anyway, what I wanted to establish here is now you're suddenly, uh, after years and years as a writer principally, uh, a, a well-recognized television personality. Mm -hmm. And how does one make that? transition? Poorly. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I feel like a fool when people stop me in airports and uh, I don't understand giving autographs. I remember when I was a kid hearing that uh, Joe DiMaggio was a great guy because he gave autographs to everybody, but why would any, why would any idiot want my autograph? Mm -hmm. I just don't want to give my autograph dumb enough to anybody who wants it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's worth nothing. Yeah, so, but you, you do go ahead and play along with it. But it is strange, it's, this desire people have to get close to uh, well-known people. What is it? I mean, why aren't they satisfied with what I write? Why do they have to get to know me and touch my tie? I don't understand that. You, you experience a lot of tie touching, eh? Yes. Yeah. So hard that going on in America. <laughs> uh, well, I think, generally, it's, it's them wanting some kind of proof that they were in the same area as a famous person. Don't but you what does that to? give them? Um, a, maybe a momentary... Uh, I don't know, boost in there, something to talk about at Burger King? I don't know. <laughs> now, in a final effort to provide a metaphor for the idea I'm driving at, I'll run a clip from the 1976 motion picture, Network. Where all you know? 
You're beginning to believe the illusions we're spinning here. You're beginning to think that the tube is reality and that your own lives are unreal. In God's name, you people are the real thing. We are the illusion. Let's imagine that Howard Beale is wrong. Let's say that movies, television programs, YouTube videos, TikToks, and Pornhub scenes are real in the philosophical sense. If we were to take these various media images up as a substance that structures reality, as a necessary universal truth that is more important than we are in our contingency, then it would make sense that people would want to touch Andy Rooney's tie. It would even make sense that journalists could report the news in advance. After all, if what's on TV is real, then that means that at least a good part of reality is planned out in advance, or already exists before it appears to us. Greetings, my friend. We are all interested in the future, for that is where you and I are going to spend the rest of our lives. When a being from that higher dimension, from this reel of television, appears in the flesh, when he comes down amongst us, when he shows up at Macy's, then touching his tie or getting an autograph is a way to participate in the miracle. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, the radical theosophist Rudolf Steiner believed in the Akashic Records. This was a secret realm where all the events in the universe, past, present, and future, were recorded. The essence of reality was, according to Steiner, contained within these records. It was something like the Force from Star Wars, or like the computer code that produces virtual reality. It was both the record of everything that existed or would exist, and it was the power that set the whole universe in motion. Along with absurd jokes, this occult notion of a universe constructed out of images, symbols, and Akashic records can produce an excessively enjoyable paranoia. America runs on Still, the idea doesn't bear up under scrutiny. If we were to imagine that the world was following a script that was secreted away in another dimension, that the world was supported by or was essentially the same as this script, then we'd have to imagine that the script contained itself, along with the secret spiritual dimension that contained it. In a previous video about Slovoj Žižek, and the problem of postmodernism, I mentioned the term spurious infinity, and I played a few clips from Paul Fry's lecture on Derrida's essay, Structure, Sign, and Play. Fry claimed that Derrida's critique of Saussure's structuralism was a critique of all structures and did not just apply to the specific sort of structure Saussure believed he had proven determined meaning in any and all linguistic systems. Structure, Sign, and Play is a critique of structurality. It's not just a critique of structuralism. In other words, I look at a structure and I say it has a center. What do I mean by a center? I mean a blanket term, a guiding concept, a transcendental signified, something that explains the nature of the structure and something also, as Derrida says, which allows for free play within the structure, but at the same time, you know, the structure has this kind of boundary nature. I mean, it may be amoeboid, but it still has boundaries, right? It is uh, both that which organizes a structure and that which isn't really qualified to organize anything because it's not in the structure, it's outside the structure. And something that imposes itself from without, like a cookie cutter, on the structure. For Derrida, all metastructures are like the Akashic Records, in that they are both the very substance of the universe and the secret occult truth, hidden from view and residing in some outside realm that explains and gives meaning to the universe. The conspiracy theory called Project Bluebeam is another example. The story goes like this. The CIA, or maybe the Elder Council of Zion, is planning to overturn and abolish Christianity. 
in order to achieve their goal, they are working with aliens from another world, receiving the technology necessary to create holographic simulations that can pass themselves off as real. The plan is that the world government will stage an event that will include the appearance of flying saucers in the skies of Earth. They will stage the landing of a holographic saucer on the White House lawn and convince the world that these aliens are the true gods. But in order for this trick to work, there have to be real aliens. In order to stage the simulation of a miracle, there has to be a real miracle that resides outside the staged event. The aliens, according to Project Bluebeam conspiracy theorists, are both fake and real, appearances and substances. Just like any other center that structures reality, the aliens reside both within and without the structure. To return to the beginning, Guy Debord argued that the world was mediated by images and that the people in it had become inert spectators. He argued that under late capitalism or in a world turned upside down, the true was a moment of the false. However, if we are to understand Debord's argument, we have to know that it is an inversion of Hegel's claim that the false is a moment of the true. For Hegel, our mistakes, our false beliefs, are part of a process of self-discovery leading to the absolute. Each mistake, when recognized, dissolves itself and sets us moving in a new direction. In this case, we can see that the idea that we are living in a simulation is a repetition of older occult notions, a revision of older systems of metaphysics. It repeats a Neoplatonic conception of reality wherein there is a realm of pure ideas or some sort of logocentric code that sets up the world of appearance. But that logocentric code would either need its own code in order to appear or would have to be its own code. This self-contradiction in simulation theory is dissolved when we consider what assumptions remain unexamined. In order for Bostrom's suggestion that we are living in a simulation to make sense, we have to accept that computer programs can be conscious, that these programs can be a site wherein virtual reality appears and is perceived and at least partially understood by some sort of subjectivity. And at this point, we can see that what appears to be a description of what's out there beyond us, about the nature of the objective world, only leads us to considering ourselves. What are we apart from the objects of our perception, objects that are rendered by the code? What is it to be conscious, alive, and aware? We have already become objects of our own understanding, even if we do think of ourselves as not very different from Kubert or Zelda. And what this means is that, even if the board is right, and we are passive inert objects directed by the ideology of the spectacle, even if we are programmed, we are also the programmers. We are the center, the force inside and outside the system. Welcome to your doom. I am powerful. I am powerful. I am strong. I am strong. I choose life. Something for the kid and all of us. I should have known those alien maggots booby trapped the sub. Our video game is hotter than ever this season. Wonderful.